Welcome to episode 51 of the Sourcing Challenge Show. I am your host, Mark Lundgren. In this episode, I sat down with Nieves Sancho from Zaragoza in Spain and asked her how she got started in sourcing. Okay, uh, so it was by accident. I wasn't looking for a um, sourcing role at all. And it was at a time where I was uh, looking for sort of an international company to work in and I saw that a multinational company um, had a talent sourcer temporary six months <laughs> contract um, and I thought oh so I see talent there's there must be something around interviews so um, it should be a um, job I can take in the meantime uh, while I'm looking for other things to do and so I, all of a sudden, I was in a sourcing role where I was a remote sourcer, sourcing IT um, candidates for the tech, uh, for the tech team based in in Germany. <laughs> and so for me, it was a um, difficult start because I was a remote sourcer in a different country had no IT background <laughs> at all and um, I was given three senior positions I even remember those solution senior solution architect product owner and technical consultant which <laughs> were very specific and I thought uh, okay uh, what are what is this and so um, I, yes, I had a, a training of um, two hours where I was <laughs> walk through what GitHub was, um, how to to look for um, specific profiles in, in LinkedIn, was shown some other platforms. So I, after those two hours, I was full of keywords which meant nothing to me <laughs> and okay i had these three positions to to start sourcing so i thought uh okay i'll try to use these keywords um put them in linkedin um search in github and of course all my shortlisted candidates have nothing to do with the with the profiles I was looking for and um, and okay I um, always say that if someone would have recorded me doing these first interviews it would have been um, hilarious um, and so I I saw that I wasn't um, advancing so I I thought um, okay I don't even know what the tech guys in in this these multinationals do what they work in mm -hmm. so I thought okay I'm gonna send an email to the the IT director mm -hmm. who was in the same floor I was and I sent him like three sentences email saying um, hey um, I would like to to run 15 minutes interviews with uh, the guys in your team so was to be able to uh, recruit people more efficiently mm -hmm. so um, in the same time that I was and he by the way answered very kindly saying of course um, go on please do it and if they have if you need more than 15 minutes i mean um the better you work the better for us yeah so um in, at the same time i was doing these interviews i was um uh, watching um videos for for dummies um about well i mean yes uh what a front end was uh, different frameworks. Um, what is a solution architect? What does he do? Um, interview questions. Um, yes, so it was 
um, actual um, myself building this type of knowledge mm -hmm. um, that um, ultimately has helped me to um, build a compelling storytelling because at the end of the day what what has helped me the most uh, in the um, in the sourcing my sourcing career has been being able to to yes to to build a compelling um a job well a, a compelling message to mm -hmm. the candidates and yes i would say that most of my um hires have been through this like telling the awesome things we we do or we want to do and how she or he could um, um be part of this of this story okay and where did you kind of, where did you look to, to learn more about sourcing or like other than kind of interviewing the engineers? I think it was a matter of, of trial and error. I saw many videos where I had no, no clue of what they were saying, but uh, there were others that uh, helped me a lot. And of course, the, um, this ability to um, speak with with the team because at the end of the day I was looking for their clones mm -hmm. so yep. um, it made sense that I had a clear view and and they would emphasize more um, I mean it's, it's like um, yes they would emphasize the things that they think that it's um, why they are in yep. the company um, for and things that they wouldn't do differently, th that they, mm, yeah, wouldn't do differently elsewhere. And I know that uh, you're one of the few people I know that sourced for my home country, Denmark. What was the big thing for you to having to, you know, to go to another country with completely different language and I'm guessing completely different culture as well? What was the, the kind of big learning from you there? Well, uh, my big learning from sourcing in Denmark, well, um, I've learned that when you start sourcing in a new country, um, what you should do is ask the team there or ask um, a per, um, an engineer, in my case, I'm in, in the tech industry, ask uh, what some developers um how is the talent landscape there mm -hmm. like how they are approached by recruiters uh how they like to be approached um because what i did wrong is that i assume that sourcing in denmark was the same as sourcing in spain for instance or in london and no so i started like asking my team um hey guys what are the different meetups you have in the city for java and they were like uh we don't have any meetups for java <laughs> there are like cloud meetups um uh, what was the other well different dot net meetups but there is a group called a uh, java Gruppen that we host events but it's not mm, a meetup and i was like <laughs> um well that it was completely different from what i expected and so um, i i realized for instance that uh, many recruiters from all over the world were uh, reaching out to them for a, and that they would pay attention only to those um, recruiters who either have a Danish name mm -hmm. or that uh, were written in in Danish. Danish yeah. And I thought like, okay, I don't have either <laughs> of them. <laughs> so um, what? We, what we thought in a brainstorming session was that um, we would put in the header of the message the, the street where the office was. Mm -hmm. and, and so um, it actually brought great results because mm -hmm. I was getting um, more answers. Um, because, yeah, you know, my name doesn't sound <laughs> Danish at all and I couldn't write any, any Danish either. <laughs> I'm guessing all the developers as well get lots of you know American recruiters who want them to move to America and yeah you know, all exactly over the, yeah. Dublin, London, 
And they uh, are not uh, willing to... They might go on holiday and they might move, but they're not going to move for a long time. Like there's a few of us that have, but in general, people like staying at home or at least close mm -hmm. to home. So uh, similar to a lot of Spanish, they want to be close to their family. So, you know, you, you can't blame them. We're a small country, so it, it shows more. Tell me about Zaragoza. You're close to Barcelona, but not really. Um, so it's a completely different it's a completely different ecosystem in terms of tech companies and things like that. So what's the kind of difference when, when sourcing locally for you? So I, I used to, to source for Zaragoza mm -hmm. um, for a big company. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the, the sourcing for that company was more successful because of the brand than because yeah. of the city because Zaragoza is not so much known. So um, overall, for a person who is recruiting for, in, for Spanish roles, I would say that, um, of course, we all know that Madrid and Barcelona's uh, community, tech community are bombarded by um, recruiters. However, um, people elsewhere um, are not as bombarded. I would mm -hmm. say that there are other two big cities where that now there is kind of like a um, um, hype with them, which are uh, Malaga and mm -hmm. the um, Valencian Valencia. area. Malaga yes. has had a lot of like traditional, they had a lot of these kind of tech support, language support and things like that, but they're getting more and more because similar to Barcelona, they they can draw people from, it's an international crowd because a lot of expats exactly. and it's good weather. Uh, they have the beach and they have some company already. Um, Valencia and that whole beach and similar thing. Uh, Saragossa a bit harder. The thing that happens in these small, in these smaller uh, cities is that there is a um, big company that offers uh, better conditions mm -hmm. than the 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 traditional ones so um that company has the ability to uh in source all the 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 other um, people because yeah. they offer better conditions and traditionally these developers are not going to move elsewhere yeah. so they kind of like have the um, the monopoly of of the talent which is what i think it happens in within the text in in la coruña and ha happens in my city with another multinational yeah. Yeah. you've seen that with some of some of the the kind of big tech companies that have not gone to barcelona they've gone to valencia instead and kind of like you're like okay they just they offer a little bit better than the local companies and that uh, but now you, you see it more and more kind of realizing it's like, okay, we can go to one of the smaller tech ops and still yes. get good talent. In, but, exactly. Yeah. And, and then, I mean, for instance, I'm thinking about uh, the Valencia, where, I mean, you have to, to be very mindful of, on how, how you deal with the, the tech community there, mm -hmm. because um, one of the, of the learnings I, I made from sourcing here is that uh, I learned not to put uh, labels to, to people such as um, we probably all have uh, bad experiences with some candidates that either have respond um, in a rude way to a message or that um, in the end decided to opt for the other company and left like the higher team like mm -hmm. um say like okay this guy is a uh, stupid no. yeah yeah so um and actually um i learned not to i mean to to assume that this is a fact that they uh, are very uh, demanded by companies yeah. and that you should um, still like uh, put persistence here um, and try to engage later on. And I'm yeah. thinking about one of my colleagues who opted for, for the competition. I mean, he had both offers and, and he opted for the competition. Um, and late, like uh, 
it wasn't three months um, since he started in the competition that I uh, just uh, wrote to him to ask how was he doing in yeah. his new job. And he said, like, um, actually, it wasn't as I expected. Um, how are you guys doing? Yeah. <laughs> and so I thought, like, oh, wow. And I said, um, well, we actually uh, are still recruiting for um, this position. Um, would you be able for a uh, talk? And he said, um, sure. And then um, we spoke. He said uh, he just uh, he was uh, in a project that ended in, in a month and that he wouldn't consider any move um, in, that, in this period. But yeah. afterwards... He, he, I mean, we, we hired him and uh, someone could have thought, okay, uh, three months in the competition. Yeah, I mean, we're not going to touch should, him. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yes, but I mean, and he's one of our best guys. Um, he's, yes, one of the stars we have in the team. So mm -hmm. mm, stories like this happens. Another one that simply didn't show up for the interview. So I thought like, what are you doing? Like, do you... And, and still we've engaged with him again. Um, yes, I could name many, many examples like this that um, you simply shouldn't give up if you know that uh, talented people are, are um, there and that they probably have many connections so yeah no, and yeah we're all busy there's different things and it's like it, it's it, it's sometimes it's like yes you don't show up for an interview it's not the best way like you should have cancelled or whatever it is but you know we've all been yeah. in situations where you know we might have gotten another offer and it's like do i go here do i cancel and like yeah you cancel but it, it's not always as as is easy or just something comes in the way and it could be family or family emergency and we've all heard those but you know, things happen and, and exactly. you're already over that thing. You know, they're interested in your company because they engaged with you in the first place. So yeah, re-engaging with them is going to be less of a part. You're going to get a better response because they know who you are and they probably know a lot of your process already. Yeah, exactly. What kind of tools do you use, Nevis? What's your, what's your go-to and, you know, you must have tools that you use on, on a daily basis. Yes. So I'm, I'm not stick to any any specific mm -hmm. tools i um, use um my brain as the first uh, tool so i i first design uh, a strategy and then uh depending on on what is needed so i choose one or the other i think i use the the regular ones everyone use like uh, Octo HR mm -hmm. for GitHub. Um, I have a LinkedIn Lite, the recruiter mm -hmm. version, and Slack communities, meetups, these kind of regular things that they, I think, but, but strategy is, is the, the, for me, the most valuable asset that you can go over again, revisit, um, think again. And, and actually, I, um, I wanted to, to tell you one thing, which mm -hmm. I think um, ma many recruiters should uh, put in place, which is uh, ask your colleagues for um, past, co past connections, mm -hmm. such as um, I would build a um, Google uh, sheet mm -hmm. with um, people from the, from their last employers mm -hmm. for, uh, that were that are working in their in their previous companies, mm -hmm. and I would ask for their opinion. So I would share this Google sheet with. Um, with two colleagues, for instance, and I would ask for their opinion to rank them and to put a comment. Yeah. And if that, if the company was very big, 
perhaps they did, they hadn't worked with mm -hmm. with that guy, but of course they heard something like something that worked in his team, and he had great reputation. Uh, so he would put that in the comments, and I believe, I mean, you um, you put them everything like it's all done you just have to go over and my experience i've done this in my previous um the the two companies mm -hmm. i've worked in at in the past and every time i do it my colleagues are actually very open to mm -hmm. to tell me and if they've and usually um if they want me to i would ask them i mean when i see mm -hmm. when i see like a great developer a star um, like when i see um highest the, the highest marks mm -hmm. um i would ask them like do you mind me mentioning that i heard very positive uh things from from them yeah. uh, from my colleague um john and james and they would say, I prefer if you didn't mention so, yeah, yeah. so that's perfectly fine. Um, if they actually don't mind, I, I mention them and, and oftentimes I hear back from, from these candidates, if they are not interested, uh, please give my regards to James and, and John, um, how I didn't know about your company. Um, it looks great. However, it's not the right time for me to mm -hmm. move. Yes, but other, other, in other situations, they are, I mean, we, we start mm -hmm. a process with them. So, um, this is also an easy way to, to have good candidates and actually like knowing which ones are ver are worth um going over again like every it's, it's it also gives months. you a it gives you a benchmark as well it's like okay these are the ones that are considered stars from wherever they came from exactly what would be uh, your advice to if somebody is in in you sh your shoes uh, like two and a half years three years ago uh completely new uh, to sourcing or you know, no recruitment, but really want to get into sourcing, where should they start? Do you have any recommendation on who to follow, uh, what to read? For, for me, um, what changed my, my career was attending the SourceCon conference in Budapest that was held in 2018, mm -hmm. um, where I saw um, people who were doing and using the same platforms I was using, but uh, one was using Data Miner, which was um, a tool for extracting data mm -hmm. and that I've never heard from that before. Um, some others were, I mean, I actually discovered the Octo HR mm -hmm. Chrome extension, which is very simple, but very useful if you uh, it, are sourcing makes... in makes GitHub sourcing a lot faster, definitely. Exactly. Um, so I was, I would ab advise them to, if they can uh, attend one of the SourceCon conferences, definitely it's worth the money, <laughs> the, the investment. Um, if not, um, they can start following the blog, which is uh, free. And also to take grasps of the sourcing basics. Um, actually, now I'm redoing um, one course, uh, which name is Power Searching with Google. Mm -hmm. And it um, goes, um, it, it's like going through the basics because sometimes I... Um, um, I missed using, for instance, uh, the custom search engine. As uh, I had um, forgotten of, about about it, and I thought, okay, I I would need to start uh, using it again because there was a time that I used it, but I don't use it anymore. And with this uh, basic course. I'm starting making uh, them again now that it's like a um, most more um, hectic time with the coronavirus crisis mm -hmm. and, and uh, it would be great 
to have um, a picture of what your team does. So, mm -hmm. for instance, I have um, one of my of my colleagues just joined um, four months ago, and she was new to uh, sourcing and to IT sourcing, mm -hmm. and I started um, by um, telling um, what our team does like mm -hmm. from i believe that from the the uh, a user perspective which is for us um easier to understand because if i start like uh talking about servers or cloud <laughs> data she won't understand anything but actually like uh for instance we are we work in eco with e-commerce platforms mm -hmm. like um introducing um what a, an e-commerce platform is mm -hmm. the different apps that they are connected and explaining then uh, what front end is, uh, what functionalities uh, we are building, such as um, the um, the payment systems, uh, the, um, the the um, yes, all the levels and things that um, the platform has and where it needs to be connected. And I see that my colleague, well, she's a great sourcer, but that she um, is able to um, run interview interviews and write compelling messages um, every day with less of my help, mm -hmm. which, is, um, which is because she has a good picture on what our team does, uh, how they work in sprint, what a TDD is, <laughs> and why, what TDD uh, enables the development team to do, and put uh, real examples about uh, real life. Well, I'm I'm married to a developer, so he um, explained these things to me first, but actually it's super simple to, to understand. And yes, so I would, I would recommend someone who is just starting uh, that they should ask uh, first to, to have a picture of the tech team in, in, the, in her or his company to um, be able to source for their clones. Nieves, if people want to uh, stay in contact with you and follow you, what kind of where it goes from here, how can they best do that? I think that they can simply send me um, a message via LinkedIn or um, Twitter. Either things would work or an email, actually. I'm very, I would be very happy <laughs> if I get reached by someone who is interested in sharing um, knowledge or yeah, asking about the, the, anything. Sounds good. Thank you very much. I uh, look forward to meeting you soon again, Nieves. Yeah. The same, Mark. If you like this episode, please consider sharing it or any of the other episodes with a friend or a colleague who might be interested as well. And consider subscribing to the channel, which will help us meet more people um, and grow the community.